Hey, good morning, everyone. Josh of Severe Weather. Happy Wednesday to you. It's been a very active week in the tropics, and we are not done yet, unfortunately. Not, not really just in the Atlantic, but really across the world, a very active week. And I'm going to talk about what's going on and what's going to potentially change here in the next couple of weeks. So I'm going to share my screen with you all. And we're talking a huge week and some unexpected twists here, mainly with Hurricane Otis, uh, which made landfall overnight near Acapulco, Mexico, as the strongest storm on record for Mexico, a Category 5 with 165 miles per hour. And that was not something I was ever going to try to predict. Nothing was showing it, just completely caught us all off guard. And unfortunately, I, I don't think it's going to have a good outcome once we see the light of the day today in Mexico. Hurricane Tammy strengthening as well, Category 2 storm, probably getting close to its peak, though, and right now, not a threat to immediate land, but we are going to have to watch her in Bermuda and even in other places. We had a strong cyclone Lola, which hit Vanuatu in the sub South Pacific. That is the earliest uh, cyclone category five in the South Pacific with respect to the seasonal year, which usually starts here later in the fall north in uh, North America and, and the Northern Hemisphere. And then Tej, which was, I believe, the sixth strongest cyclone in the Arabian Sea, which made landfall in Yemen uh, just over a day ago. So, so a lot going on in the tropics. We're in an El Nino. Much of the ocean waters are warmer than average. Here's a look at what the last several days has looked like in the tropics. And you can see a lot of places getting a lot of hits here. Um, you can see Norma actually made landfall over Cabo San Lucas a few days ago as a Category 1 hurricane. Otis made landfall as a Category 5, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. We did have a depression hit Nicaragua yesterday morning. Tammy uh, has strengthened now to a Category 2 storm. If I uh, go ahead and update that, you all be able to see that. Uh, yep, Category 2 hurricane with 100 mile per hour winds and tracking closer to Bermuda here towards the weekend. Uh, we also had Hamoon, which was a Category, almost a Category 2 cyclone here, which made landfall uh, near the Bangladesh Myanmar border, and that's causing flooding problems now across parts of South Asia. Uh, not on the map anymore, but Tej made landfall near the Oman Yemen border. Uh, it was a category three. And we also have Lola, which was a category five storm. Winds were up to 140 miles per hour with that, uh, now moving down towards Vanuatu. And I don't think we're finished in the Pacific or even the Atlantic just yet. So we're going to talk more about that. Uh, here's what's going on. Let me make this a little bigger for you guys to see. Uh, we are we are towards the peak of an El Nino where the uh, ocean water temperature, the oceanic Nino index is about 1.1 to 1.2 degrees Celsius above average. That's an El Nino. Uh, typically, the wa waters here of the central and eastern South Pacific run above average in an El Nino. But unfortunately, uh, in the Caribbean, off of the African coast and in the Western Pacific, and really much of the tropics except west of Indonesia, we're also seeing above average water temperatures. And that's something we don't typically see. Um, this, is, this is a decadal cy um, cycle that we're in. It's very possible down the road that all this warmth leads to a kind of a bottleneck and eventually things cool down. Uh, but we can't really ever predict that. Um, I, I don't wanna call it a climate emergency. I think that's really <clears throat> jumping the gun on this. But obviously things are very busy. Now, if you look at the total number of cyclones this year, we're in the 70s and an average calendar year sees about 90 some tropical cyclones worldwide. So we're actually not really running that much above average, but we are seeing storms that are intensifying more quickly than average. Uh, case in point is Otis yesterday went from a tropical storm this time yesterday morning to a category five overnight, now weakening as it's made landfall. And that's not something anyone could ever really predict. So anyway, yeah, crazy things going on, but I'm gonna do my very best to try to keep things calm and level-headed here, show you guys what's going on, what we can kind of expect. And in the Atlantic Basin, really only one storm to be concerned with, and right now not affecting land, that is Hurricane Tammy, category two hurricane, winds are 100 miles per hour. And ironically, I had this getting to category two, and then I backed off yesterday and it, did what I thought I was going to do. So I kind of, I don't know, I flip-flopped and that happens. I'm, I'm not going to be hard on myself. It's not affecting land right now, uh, but winds are hundred miles per hour. Could strengthen just a touch more here. Probably not going to get to major hurricane status, but it may be getting close this morning. Uh, it is now moving Northeast at 10 miles per hour, but expected to make a left turn. As we take a look here at the tropics, uh, we can see just how busy things have been, not in the Gulf, not on the West, East coast, and not on the West Coast, but certainly in Mexico. Here was Otis, tropical storm this time yesterday, rapid intensification, 
uh, the second quickest intensification on record in the Eastern Pacific. The one that did uh, beat that rate was Hurricane Patricia, which was the strongest Eastern Pacific storm on record in 2018. And that did weaken back to category four when it hit uh, west of Acapulco. This one did not. It hit at its peak here at 165 miles per hour. Uh, we did have Tropical Depression 21 in the Atlantic. That has moved well inland to Nicaragua. It's actually beginning to flare back up here on the Pacific side. And if you are in the area that has just gotten hit with Otis, you need to watch this area. I would love to say we can let our guard down and take a breather. I don't think that's going to be the case, though. This is showing signs of organization in the next couple of days, and models are really struggling as to what's going to happen. And then here you see it in the uh, northwest Atlantic, Tammy, which hit uh, the northern Leeward Islands as a Category 1 hurricane over the weekend. Remains a hurricane. It's been a hurricane now for five days, which is pretty astonishing this close to the United States and North America this late in the season, category two hurricane growing in size and starting to see a little bit of a transition here with a front approaching it to maybe what could be an extra tropical or post-tropical system for the time being. And then behind Tammy, we're watching some flare up here over the Atlantic that some models, i.e. the GFS show could develop over time here, maybe in about 10 to 12 days as that moves west. Here's a look at I'm going to slow it down just a little bit for you guys here, um, but a look at the last basically 24 hours. And you can see Tammy here has grown in size and has developed uh, a healthier core for the time being. Wind shear is going to pick up and we're going to get some cooler waters pretty soon. Uh, here is Tropical Depression 21 made landfall early yesterday in Nicaragua. The central circulation is pretty much wiped out, but the convection remains. The upper level feature does have a chance at, at uh, reorganizing. It's gonna take a little time to do so, but here off the El Salvador, uh, Guatemalan and Honduran Pacific coastline. And then on the edge, you can see Hurricane Otis. And I'm gonna show you a little bit more of that here just a bit. Uh, behind Tammy here, we are gonna keep an eye on some thunderstorms right now, which, sorry for jumping on you guys, which don't really look like they're gonna develop into anything in the next six or seven days. There's an upper level low here. There's a monsoonal trough here. We're not really in the phase of the Madden-Julian oscillation, which is the teleconnection between the Pacific and the Atlantic that favors strong intensification. But it is something we need to keep an eye on because uh, the guts of this system is expected to eventually move westward and cross into the Caribbean here for the last week of October. Here's a look at Tammy and definitely looking healthier on satellite. This is Bermuda right here. Um, and you can see the storm moving northeast. It has developed a cleared out eye. Um, once again, another healthy looking storm in the open waters of the Atlantic. That's what the fifth one we've seen this year, fourth or fifth. And that's not uncommon for El Nino. Uh, wind shear is expected to pick up a little bit, but it's gonna move into some cooler water as well. And that's obviously something that um, we like to see because it means the system will be weakening. Sorry about this jumpiness here. Let me slow that down. Uh, here you can see Tammy last night beginning to develop that core. Wind field has grown. And now you see the eye popping out overnight and definitely a category two hurricane has a very tiny shot at getting to category three. But I do think as she gets into cooler water, she is going to weaken gradually here. Uh, the official forecast shows a turn to the left. I've been talking about this for several days. This is Bermuda. The track has shifted a little bit further south of Bermuda and it slowed down. So a couple of days ago, it looked like Bermuda could be very much in the crosshairs Friday or Saturday. Now, if you look, you can see it's going to take about four to five days to even get to within 100 miles of the island, which is good news because as it does that, it's expected to slow down. It's going to get trapped between a trough to the west and a ridge to the north and east. And at that point, over cooler water, while the system is probably going to grow some more, it is going to weaken and get down to uh, minimal tropical storm strength. Um, there's a chance it could be a little bit stronger than this, but right now that is the actual prediction. Um, the question mark is going to be where it goes after this, and that's what we're going to have to talk about here in a little bit. Models show a bit of a loop, and then some show it exiting to the right. It gets picked up by a trough. Others show it missing that trough, getting stuck a little farther south of 30 north. And if it does that, it has the opportunity to move a little bit more to the west and even west-southwest. And that's what we've been talking about. And something you've got to keep an eye on in the Bahamas and maybe even South Florida um, as we get towards the beginning of November. Now, if it does that, it's going to be a weaker system. It's not going to look like it does today. Um, but if it does get into some warmer water down in here and the wind shear relaxes enough, it is something I still think we need to, to keep an eye on. But right now, the chance of that happening is less than 50-50. 
uh, there's a, a pretty good chance that it, it gets farther west and then gets kicked out by the next front, which is going to be our Halloween cool down coming here in the Carolinas and parts of the south. Um, there's also a chance it doesn't even make it that far west. The trough does pick it up, turns it to the right, and it accelerates out to sea. That was the original forecast. That's what you would expect this time of the year, something that accelerates, hits the subtropical jet stream, and it's out of our hair. I would love to say this one's definitely doing that, but we still are going to be scratching our heads a little bit longer with it. And uh, the European Ensemble shows the same thing, backwards S, and then turning to the right and probably getting kicked out, maybe doing a couple of loops, doing some crazy things out there. Um, I cannot forecast what's actually going to happen. No meteorologist can. The models, as you can see, have been struggling with systems out in the open Atlantic all season. They've been doing that for a while now. Um, they've been missing a lot of things. As a meteorologist, all I can really do is just kind of give you my take at this point. There's still a lot of uncertainty here with this. I would love to say it's getting better, but it's not. Uh, the Canadian Ensemble shows it going south of Bermuda. That's the island here and continuing west, a weaker group of solutions, pulling it closer to the Bahamas and maybe Florida. Uh, some killing it, turning it northeast, others turning it away where it could be a little bit stronger. So that's what we're looking at. The one good thing I am here to share with you guys is that it's probably getting close to its peak in intensity. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if we saw it getting up to close to category three here later today, but that's going to be about the peak of things. As we get into cooler water, it should weaken steadily down to category one by tomorrow and likely tropical and post-tropical storm by the time we get to Thursday night and Friday and unlikely to re-strengthen at that point. The ICON model, not the strongest of tropical models, but it's been the most consistent right now of all the global models. You can see um, that it is turning the storm tomorrow morning at this time to the Northwest. It is not weakening yet, but then as it gets to Friday, it is weakening gradually back to tropical storm strength. This little dot here is Bermuda. Here's the ICON about 150 miles south of Bermuda by Friday. It's moving slowly, but it continues it on that track and does weaken it. Um, at this point, it may be post-tropical over the weekend. It still, though, has tropical storm strength with it. And then we probably have winds below 40 miles per hour by the time here we get into uh, the weekend. Looking back one model, interestingly, the icon's a little bit quicker than it is with this latest model run. Um, it has it continuing as a moderate to lower end tropical storm moving towards the Bahamas here later on Sunday. So this is faster than every other model I've seen. Um, it's a little stronger with this high pressure ridge over the east coast here, but you can see uh, late in the weekend, it's approaching the Bahamas and then maybe South Florida by Sunday night and Monday. This is probably the most extreme solution. I really don't necessarily see this playing out this way, and you can see how weak it is. Uh, so if you're in South Florida, obviously keep an eye on it, but I don't think it's going to get to you before the end of the weekend. If anything, if it is surviving, it's got very little convection left with it. Uh, just a circulation with a little bit of shower activity moving into South Florida next week. Now, looking at the GFS model, you can see uh, while Tammy is holding her own, there's a lot of dry air that is going to get entrained into the southern portion of the system. And that is going to probably break open that eye and allow that dry air to get in there and allow the system to become post-tropical by the time we get into Friday. It's showing it merging with this front southeast of, the, of uh, Bermuda. And you can see there is a ton of moisture feed behind it. There's an upper low over the Central Caribbean. So things are gonna stay very wet over the greater Antilles and even the lesser Antilles this weekend. We could have a flood threat for portions of Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, the Virgin and Leeward Islands right into the beginning of next week. You can see the GFS does take this upper low across the Caribbean and send some moisture up in the South Florida here by next Tuesday, Halloween, and then it stops. This front's gonna hit it here by the beginning of November. But unfortunately, this time of the year with the waters being so warm, when a front stalls in an area, if the wind shear starts lessening, we can see some sort of cyclogenesis or storm development. And that's something we're gonna have to keep an eye on here in the Caribbean. Um, this particular model loves to strengthen things very quickly. It shows what could be a hurricane over Western Cuba and then moving towards Florida. I'm not gonna predict that. It's just way too far out. We gotta see what's even on the map this weekend first. But you can see we may not be done with the tropics just yet. So still keep an eye on things in the Caribbean. Here's a GFS model. You can see Tammy here. It's gonna be killing that convection pretty quickly as it approaches Bermuda. Still a storm that you don't wanna be out in a ship or on a cruise ship with because it's gonna have a lot of wave action and a lot of moisture with it. But you can see the GFS actually kicks it away to the right. And then you can see things starting to form over the Central Caribbean here by the beginning of November keeping an eye on this potential feature down here. And here's the GFS surface map. You can see Tammy is probably gonna get its str uh, strongest point here this afternoon and then weaken as it bends back to the left. 
no longer expected to come right over Bermuda, but it will be close enough to be a potential threat here this weekend. And then as we go further off into time, you can see another storm here over the Eastern Pacific, uh, which is exactly what we saw with Otis coming into the exact same area. I'm gonna talk about that in just a bit, uh, but you can see Tammy is moving away. And then we have to keep an eye on another circulation, which I think the GFS shows to be um, excessively strong from what it probably will be. But interestingly, this would be a Southwest Florida hit. Again, I'm not trying to scare folks in Florida. Uh, this will change 5,000 times between now and then. But obviously, we've got to keep an eye on the Caribbean as something may try to spin up in here. If it gets up into the Gulf, honestly, I'd be a little bit surprised at this point. Here's the Pacific. Hurricane Otis weakening now over land. As of 5 o'clock Eastern, it was 130 miles per hour. When you're tuning in, it's probably already going to be weaker than that as it's getting into higher elevation. But behind it, we now have a 60% chance of development the remains of Tropical Depression 21 and a circulation center forming. And this looks eerily similar to Otis. Otis formed down in here. Originally, it was expected to track parallel to the coast and not get super strong. It did get pulled northward into an area of very warm water. This system looks like it's got the opportunity to do the same thing as we get later into next week. I'm not really worried about this area out here. It's probably not going to develop. Uh, but if you take a look here at uh, the satellite, you can see things uh, and how they're quickly evolving. Otis is now moving inland, still a major hurricane, but probably going to be down to tropical storm strength by the afternoon, causing extreme amounts of flooding here in south central Mexico. Here's the next one already beginning to organize. I think it's going to overachieve and become our next hurricane in the Pacific, probably in about four to six days from now. So keep an eye on this wave as well. Not worried about what's out here. I don't even know what the Hurricane Center is trying to predict with that, but I just don't think it's going to happen. Here you can see Otis has moved inland. Still a well-defined hurricane, but obviously losing its core as it moves into um, much higher elevation. But taking a look at Otis, just nobody predicted this was going to get nearly as strong. You could see that yesterday morning it began to develop a core, and uh, we were officially expecting it to be a Category 1 hurricane. That's what everything showed. And then as we got to about lunchtime, it started to develop a core and got to Category 2. In the afternoon, it was up to 3. By the evening of 4, and peaked as it hit near Acapulco as a Category 5, now down to probably a 3. Uh, but this is just insane to see something like this. Um, Hurricane Center forecaster um, Philippe Papin showed the eye wall coming right across Acapulco. It wobbled a bit. It looked like it was going to go right, and then it wobbled back to the left. And you can see all the lightning action here yesterday with the storm and made landfall uh, just after midnight Mexican time. This is the first time we've seen a Category 5 hurricane making landfall, and unfortunately in an area where about a million people live and a lot more people vacation. Uh, 125 Central Time was the official landfall point, 165 miles per hour, five miles south of Acapulco, and the pressure down to 923. Um, this was just a storm that was a nightmare to predict, and once we saw it happening yesterday, we just couldn't play catch up with it, and it seems to be a more occurring uh, occurrence here, recurring occurrence um, in uh, in the world today where we have storms that models just can't quite figure out how strong they're going to be. And once they latch onto it, it's a little bit too late to prepare. So those are the times ahead of us here. Uh, you can see the storm is going to weaken pretty significantly and be gone in about 24 hours. Um, you can see um, if we look at the cyclone forecast from just 24 hours ago, we had three three models which showed this getting just above category one threshold. Everything else had it as a tropical storm, uh, which is about the worst bust I've ever seen in tropical cyclone modeling history. If you look back even at the late morning runs yesterday, only two models showed it getting to category one strength. Then as we got to 18Z, it was very clear that it was gonna be a major hurricane. Now you see several models were at category three. Nothing though had it at category five. The Hurricane Center caught on and did call this uh, a category five, but not until about two o'clock yesterday afternoon. And then obviously it was a little too late. I mean, half the models don't even know what's going on. It's like wake up models. Um, so <clears throat> we got to category five strength. Here you can see Otis is gonna fall apart over central Mexico. It's gonna cause a lot of rain and flooding. Here's our next system and the GFS is already jumping on top of this one. And I think the other models are gonna eventually get to that point, but this is, this is Saturday night, Sunday morning. It's already got a hurricane down here near the Gulf of Tuanapec and take a look at where it's tracking the system right into almost the exact same spot here by the time we get to next Tuesday. <clears throat> Crazy times. Um, this was Cyclone Tej, only the seventh category three plus cyclone in the post-monsoon season in the Arabian Sea. So 
Um, this storm has now become just a remnant low, but you can see a very rare event as well in the Arabian Sea. And uh, here it was as it moved in to uh, land here about 48 hours ago. So just crazy times ahead and now a remnant low. Here you can see the next one in the uh, Bay of Bengal. Um, and this one was Hamoun, now a remnant low moving into Myanmar, but it had winds over 90 miles per hour, fortunately running out of room um, or it would have done the same thing, probably gone up past category three. You can see, let me make this a little bit smaller for you guys, but you can see it had the eye and then it came into Bangladesh and just a tremendous amount of rain, probably leading to fatalities sadly here. And then in the South Pacific, our earliest forming severe cyclone got up to category five, South Pacific, 145 miles per hour. It moved through Vanuatu last night, now down to category three, 85 miles per hour. Their categories are a little higher than ours in uh, North America, but expected to weaken as it moves towards New Caledonia. Uh, but just some crazy stuff here. You can see the cyclone moving south and west right over more islands affecting more people. And here's what it looked like at its peak. And then it hit some dry air and some cooler waters and fortunately not remaining a category five any longer. <sighs> my thoughts and prayers are with everybody in the path of these storms. I show them to you guys. My goal is not to get the clicks here. I know it's crazy stuff, but these are real people being affected by real weather. And it's really sad to see. And I, I just don't think we can do anything to stop it, unfortunately. Um, so anyway, let's roll on here and talk about the U.S. A lot of you guys are watching from the U.S. And I welcome you. And you can see here, a pretty strong ridge of high pressure building into the east. Things are going to warm up very quickly. Strong trough into the west. This is pretty common to see in the mid-fall season, but it's going to bring abrupt changes to us. And as we roll on into next week, we can see much colder air comes down. And the timing is still about a bit uncertain, but Tuesday, Wednesday timeframe, things are going to drop very quickly here in the east. And we're going to go from near record warmth this weekend to potential lake snows as we get into the beginning of November. So be preparing yourself now, get that heat check now because we're gonna need it. Um, then that cold leaves and we warm right back up for the following weekend here. So back and forth for a while. Uh, the European shows our big storm in the West with heavy snow in the mountains, chilly rain on the West Coast. We see showers and storms, which will be pretty heavy over the plains here. Uh, we saw some pretty big hail in Minnesota and Wisconsin yesterday. Still a big high pressure system in the Southeast that's producing coastal fog. We had major fog issues. In the greater New Orleans area on Monday, we're still going to have fog in parts of the southeast as this moisture creeps right back up. A very warm end to the week, and the weekend is not looking terrible in the northeast. We are going to see some showers across uh, the northern tier of the northeast, then a bigger round of rain moving through the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes on Sunday, and we are going to turn wet by the end of the weekend here in northern New England. But if you're in New York and Philly, you get by pretty much dry here this weekend uh, with mild temperatures in place. Here's the front. Um, models are still um, at odds at the timing of it, but this is next Monday, and you can see it's moving through the Appalachians down to the western Gulf Coast. This is Halloween, and we're going to see much cooler weather filtering in behind the front. The European shows it down to Georgia, northern Florida, much cooler here. We may not get out of the 50s or low 60s in places like Houston or Lafayette, Louisiana. So it could be quite a chilly Halloween for those of you in the Western Gulf states. Look at the upper Midwest, the Great Lakes. We're gonna see unsettled weather coming off the lake, potentially some grapple, lake snows, some mixed precipitation off of Lake Michigan. So it's not looking like a pleasant Halloween at all across the Great Lakes. Um, and that cold filters east, we may even have a coastal low come in. And this is the European model showing a little bit of mischief here for the higher elevations of the Northeast by the time we get into Wednesday evening. So stay tuned on that one. Again, that's probably gonna change. Uh, the bigger concern right now is for a little more severe weather across Texas and Oklahoma, as well as the Mid-Missouri Valley today. Uh, and a very decent chance for flash flooding here west of Dallas around Abilene, down around San Angelo, up to just south and east Oklahoma City. We do have a moderate risk for excessive rainfall. As we get to tomorrow, there's still a marginal risk I think over parts of Iowa and Wisconsin, there may be a little bit of hail, but generally speaking, just some thunderstorms and those are gradually gonna shift eastward. We do also have a threat for some heavy rain tomorrow uh, across parts of Wisconsin and Northwestern Michigan and a marginal risk for some flooding around San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, and just to the west of Houston, Texas. And all this is gradually gonna shift east with heavy rain becoming a threat. Look at our temperature profiles Big time cold coming down into Montana, 30 to 35 degrees below average. 
uh, during the day today and big time warmth out ahead of it here across Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, shifting to the northeast as we get to the weekend. Look at this contrast here. You can see the front very clearly dropping down through the Great Lakes into Ontario and Quebec here early next week. Check this out here. We're going from 15 degrees above average to 15 below average in less than a day here. Um, this cool weather continues to drop south and the beginning of November should be very chilly with respect to average. You're gonna have to run the heat in places like Dallas, Texas, certainly up across the Ohio Valley and still remaining cold where there'll be snow on the ground across the upper Midwest. But this is gonna flip pretty quickly as we get towards next weekend and look how quickly things moderate by the 5th and 6th of November. Much of the country is gonna end up above average. Canada will still be a bit below average except for um, the, the uh, Rockies provinces here. And total snowfall amounts are gonna start piling up. Anytime you've got cold air running into moisture, you're gonna get significant snow. Check out Montana and the Dakotas and Northwestern Ontario gets up to Quebec as well. Uh, we're gonna see potentially two to three feet of snow in some of these locations. Take a look at the Great Lakes as well. We're looking at lake snows kicking in here at the very end of October and the beginning of November. And we could see locally over a foot off of Lake Superior, over six inches off of Lake Michigan, and maybe three to six inches here in the snow belts of Ohio, Northwest PA and upstate New York, and some snow across the Northern uh, mountains here of uh, New England as well, putting an end to our fall foliage season. It's a lot of stuff to talk about, folks. Again, I'm not trying to scare folks. My goal is just to get you guys seeing what's going on right now to help you prepare for what's to come. And nobody can really predict what's actually going to happen. We will do our very best. I feel like I try my very best, put my best foot forward. But obviously, there's a lot still to figure out. And if there weren't, I don't think I would be very successful in this business if anybody could figure it out. But I really appreciate y'all's time. Everybody means the world to me. If you are a subscriber, please consider becoming a member if you feel led to, $9.99 a month, 33 cents a day. And if you are a first time guest, please consider subscribing. Um, but I thank you all so much. I give all the glory to God who gives me the, the gift of being able to share with you guys. Um, he has saved me from a, a lifetime of honestly, a fear and doubt that I was in for a long time. I was able to finally have my heart opened up to the spirit of God through Jesus Christ, the savior. And I just feel that's something I need to share with you guys. I feel led to do that. Um, Second Timothy one seven says for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This is very scary stuff when I talk about the weather. It's easy to be fearful, but know that God is here to bring us together, to give us the power and to give us eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. So no matter what happens to us here, if we choose to believe in him, which I have, then that has taken away the discouragement, the angst, the uncertainty, the fear of what's to come next, taking that all away, shed us of the uncertainty and given us the certainty that we can live uh, victoriously with Jesus eternally. And that's why I've become a Christian, knowing that there are things that I just can't explain to you guys, but I truly believe make a huge difference. My thoughts and prayers are with everybody dealing with these storms. Um, I, I can see why they would be fearful. I think living on the coast, you have to have some sort of fear knowing what could happen. Um, but there's always the opportunity to just not live on the coast in the first place. I mean, there's just, I mean, the waters are warm. Storms are going to form. There's no stopping that. God's not going to stop that. All he's going to do is help you to build your faith up in him and believe in him and know that there is a bright future ahead. So I'm happy to pray for you no matter what your situation. And I hope you all have a blessed Wednesday. We'll chat again tomorrow morning. God bless you.